Well, good morning, shipmates. Nice to see you here uh, in the morning. And uh, did you have a good time in Myanmar? Yes. Well, it's quite a, quite a remarkable place, and I particularly appreciate the introduction we had from our other speakers, which made it even more interesting and uh, uh, appreciative of this very unusual place. Um, and I only have one word for it after going to the great Suedagon Pagoda and the other ones. It's a country that is absolutely stupefying. I'm sorry. I'm sorry about that. I'm sorry about that. I will stop there and continue on into my my uh, specialty. Well, I'm the captain of a research vessel that is currently in dry dock in, in uh, Spain, but I've sailed across the Indian Ocean many times, and it is one of uh, the great oceans of the world, of course, and I'm going to sort of take you on a hop, skip, and jump around uh, some places we're not going to get to go, just so we can um, appreciate how vast it is. Of course, this uh, picture is the, the great uh, blue view of the, the glass, uh, blue glass ball of uh, the earth with the Indian Ocean and it is by name of course defined by um, its central geographical feature is India which sort of takes central place in it though of course it's the to a lot of Africans it's called the Eastern Ocean and there are other names and all kinds of other local places because it's been uh, fed by rivers and uh, has bays and many parts to it. Um, but when we're out here, of course, it just looks like this and that we could be anywhere. And this is an example just how the ocean is really one around the world. And when you li finally leave land, uh, you're out in the, the watery planet where there's a different sense of reality and uh, th that we would have the great pleasure to be on a beautiful ship like this and enjoying ourselves is again uh, something that would have astounded uh, previous sailors and travelers because they would go out to sea with much trepidation. But uh, the Indian Ocean has been transported uh, humans for many millennia. We don't really even know when the first boats and crafts started to leave the shore and cross the oceans. But this is one of the most uh, ancient human um, oceans in the sense of trading and mixing with different cultures. And its feature is that when you leave either Africa, India, the Arabian Peninsula, or the islands of Indonesia and down to Australia, the Indian Ocean is open to the south. Unlike the Atlantic, which gets pinched, or even the Pacific, which has islands a lot of places, the Indian Ocean is sort of a wilderness uh, at, uh, at sea as you go down toward the Southern Ocean and Antarctica. So the International Maritime Organization and others will, and oceanographers will define certain demarcations so that for legal purposes and such you can say you're on which part of the sea and, and how, however you wish to judge it but actually as this illustration shows it's actually one world ocean because the seas do connect and we are all islanders essentially no matter how big our island is and therefore the ocean has many parts but it's all very much interconnected particularly through uh, climate and currents and such now we're going to be going through the tropical zone, which in short is the part of the ocean that is not just the warmest, but it also has a, a more oxy, oxygen depletion, so that a lot of the reason why the far north and the far south has a lot of life in it is that cold, the colder the water, the more it holds its oxygen, the more life you know, from plankton, zooplankton, uh, becomes the food chain that the higher marine mammals and such uh, live on. But uh, there's a, there's a uh, cyclical system through the world ocean which spreads the temperature around and very importantly minerals from the seabed and from the rivers. We saw that the great muddy outflow of the Irrawaddy, well that's a major, um, let's say, fertilizer for the ocean, that there would be currents that would then take that around, mix it up. Um, and one of the primary uh, uh, instigators of this world current is actually off of the uh, coast of Greenland where there's a great sub-ocean waterfall of coal water that comes and goes down and then spreads all the way to the Indian Ocean and then comes up the surface and gets heated and there's a backflow in red you see in this illustration that then circulates the uh, ocean waters just as if it was a living uh, organism with a blood circulation. And then there's the uh, seabed which is stitched together in this illustration with the, the mid 
ocean ridges, the largest being the Atlantic one, and then there's a very long one in the Pacific, and then the Indian Ocean has one that comes from the Arabian Peninsula and, and the Red Sea and the Rift Valley all the way down toward Antarctica. Now this is the result of, you know, the tectonic plates moving the land masses, which are sort of a, I call a pastry on top of the hot mantle of the, uh, the, the globe. And so by geological um, comparisons, all of these uh, continents once fitted together and they've been breaking and spreading apart from going back hundreds of millions of years and forming seas in between. So this is uh, Gondwana land, which is actually named of af in Sanskrit after a mythical forest called uh, Gondwana that uh, then for some reason ended up as a geological term for a prehistoric uh, land masses that began to separate and then formed what they call the Tethys Sea, Tethys being a, a Roman god of the ocean. Um, and then there's these uh, proto-continents of Laurasia and again Gondwana, which then separated in the Indian Ocean, like the Atlantic, has been actually expanding over time and uh, making distinct continents. So every time you go across one of these oceans, particularly the Indian and the Atlantic, you will notice that it, it actually gets wider about a centimeter a year, in case you are keeping track of your journey that careful, carefully. But in the Indian Ocean, the primary geological event was the, the um, motion of the Indian subcontinent, which had been separated from the Asian continent, and then it has, over the millions of years, impacted the northern continent, and then given rise through subduction to the the Himalayas, the great mountain range that stretches all around India. And so that then put India and central to the, the history and the current life, of course, of the uh, Indian Ocean as the great peninsula that it is, mostly flat, very low. And of course, we're, we're crossing right now across the, uh, the Bay of Bengal. That's is where Yangon, and now we're north of the uh, Andaman Islands and coming then down to Sri Lanka to Colombo there. So this is a, a major part of the uh, Indian Ocean, but it uh, is all still part of the Indian plate so that uh, uh, it's fairly stable. It doesn't have uh, the earthquakes and volcanoes that other rim areas do. And then on the, on the seabed, there's a considerable fracturing um, tremendous mountain ranges, which is typical of all of the oceans. Of course, we're sort of on the surface. We, we don't uh, realize the, uh, the, first of all, the great depth in the Indian Ocean is on average about 3,000 meters deep, and then it goes down to almost uh, 6,000 meters at the deepest point. But if you look at it closely in these kind of illustrations, you see that the Red Sea is the continuation of the Rift Valley, and then the fracture zones go out of the Gulf of Aden, and then all the way down toward the central part of the Indian Ocean, uh, just right here, where the ship will be going after it's in the Persian Gulf, uh, this is the gap into the Red Sea called the Bab al-Mandar, which in Arabic means the, um, the bridge of stones, because it's only 29 kilometers across the widest part. And that's been famously uh, uh, a constriction for sailors because of the, the currents and the tides and the weather will uh, mean that many a ship in ancient times would founder right on those rocks right there. There's currently a plan that's been um, proposed by the Bin Laden Saudi Construction Company, the one of the largest in the Middle East, to put a bridge across there to uh, facilitate transport, particularly for Muslims from Africa to have a road all the way to uh, Mecca and Medina. Uh, but the cost is estimated at 20 to $30 billion, and they figure it's probably better just to build new ferries. And of course, airplanes have obviated that whole project somewhat, but it may be built, may be built by the Chinese by the end of the day, as we were, have heard. Um, but then you go out of the Red Sea, and you're, you can see the, the great uh, abyssal plain of the um, Arabian Sea, and then the fracture zones. Now, if we had a glass bottom boat, we might be able to see these things, but of course it's all deep and dark. And so these illustrations are quite fantastic though, of the, the amount of tremendous valleys and then occasional islands are on top of a seamount. Uh, but there's a great deal of uh, mystery in the, in the bottom of the sea. Of course, now oceanographers and adventurers like James Cameron have been going down there and 
visiting briefly, but it's in some ways far more difficult to go to the bottom of these great abyssal plains than it is to go to the moon. Well, if we can follow this down toward the Somali Basin, the various trenches, there's a Madagascar, there's some high plateaus where the Seychelles are, and more uh, mounts like La uh, Reunion and Mauritius, and the uh, Rodriguez Island. So the, these specks of islands are the tips of tremendous mountain ranges. And of course, they tend to be, get eroded and perhaps disappear over time. But then again, other ones come uh, come up out of the sea. Most famously in the Pacific, maybe you saw a bit of that in Tonga and around there, where there are new islands being made. But there's a there's no volcanoes that are active in the central Indian Ocean, only on the edges of it. Well, here's more of the rift valleys now going down to uh, Cape Hope off South Africa, and you can see how the the, uh, the sea is sort of spread over these great uh, lines of mountain ranges. And um, here's going further south down to Prince Edward Island, and there's a few specks of land in what is the border of the uh, southern Indian Ocean and uh, this, the, the waters off of Antarctica. Uh, this is uh, uh, Kerguelen Islands, which are uh, French possession, but though uh, they're uninhabited except by some uh, researchers down there. The deepest uh, waters of all are actually in a trench off of Western Australia, the Diamanda uh, Ridge, where it goes down to almost 20,000 feet over 6,000 meters down in the deeps off of uh, the point of land south of Perth. So this is just the nature of the ocean that it has uh, such a depth and such a variation that there's probably a great deal of life down there that we don't even know about. We get to see bits of it as we go around the world and if you're a diver you can see what's near the surface but it's a great mystery what is actually down in those depths where the water pressure is so crushingly strong and then the temperatures go down to near freezing. See this is a temperature chart for across the Indian Ocean where the uh, the, the, the bottom surfaces are often oh, just one degree Celsius, but they're incredibly compressed. And so creatures that live down there are usually invertebrates and they are uh, gelatinous, like jellyfish, to survive in that kind of environment. Well, back up to where we have been, this is the Isle of Sumatra and uh, Malaysia, Singapore there on the tip of the Malay Peninsula. Now this is, uh, a again, a mountain range that uh, has been surrounded by the rising seas over the last millions of years. And so you have very high mountains on Sumatra and on Java, and not so much on the Malay Peninsula. But what that area is is a subduction zone for these tectonic plates, which led to the great earthquake and tsunami in the December of 2004. And there are straits through this area. Now, most of the shipping goes around by the Straits of Malacca. Um, but the other entrance from the, the Pacific into the Indian Ocean is the Sunda Strait off the tip of Java and Sumatra. Now that, we've sailed through a number of different times. It's, it's a fairly tricky navigation, uh, but the real problem is, is that there are warnings on the marine charts to beware of volcanic explosions. So that's why uh, it's never really developed into a major shipping center is because of uh, this kind of activity. Now there's currently a, a volcano that's been erupting in the island of Bali, Mount Agung. This is a Merapi on Java and they regularly have some eruptions, the most famous of which of course was in, in um, Krakatoa in 1883. Uh, and this was uh, detailed in a book by my friend Simon Winchester about the explosion that was heard around the world because it cast enough dust into the air so that it was felt uh, around the world and it was also the first uh, natural disaster that was put out into by telegraph so everybody could hear a daily update about it and so this uh, meant that uh, this explosion could happen again now what's that particular what they call a uh, plasticine explosion, which is the most violent form of eruptions, different from a, let's say, a steady flow like you get on uh, Mauna Lea and Hawaii. But it blew the whole top of the mountain away and has left a uh, crater that is still hot down below the sea. So they have warnings on the marine charts to stay away from what they call Anak Krakatoa, which means the son of 
the mountain, Krakatoa. And so that, again, has uh, meant that the proposals to build a bridge across from Sumatra to Java have never been realized because they can't trust the, the earth to allow it just because of this volcanic activity. And then there's the other earthquakes and the disaster that, again, we all know about uh, now quite a while ago, 2004, where all along the Sunda Trench there was some 25 earthquakes as a great slippage subsea. Um, there was not that much volcanic activity, but the, the rumbling of the earth created the great tsunami that then swept across the Indian Ocean. These are just the sites of the the, the one or two day period earthquakes all off the tip of uh, Sumatra. And of course we were right there in Phuket, right onto the right side of the screen. And so this animation was made of just the effect of it. So these great tsunami waves usually travel about 500 nautical miles an hour. So you don't have much warning once uh, they've been released. And so the, the, the wave well, it hit Phuket and came around on the other side of Sumatra, but it particularly damaged the uh, east coast of India, Sri Lanka, and then was felt all the way on the Horn of Africa. And it was measured around the world. There was a ripple effect on all the world's oceans just from this one event. And this is what it left in uh, Assei, uh, Sumatra, where the entire city was completely washed over. They still don't know quite how many people died. It, definitely in the 100,000 or more, but many communities that were isolated just simply disappeared. Nowadays, as I mentioned before, there's a warning system that's been put out in the Indian Ocean to match one in the Pacific and even one in parts of the Atlantic, which has a satellite network that will warn of any tsunami to match the seismic record so the people at least have warning to, to leave the shore when it happens. Now, the Indian Ocean has a very predictable uh, weather patterns between um, the winter and the summer so that uh, it's either counterclockwise in the southern hemisphere below the equators it becomes clockwise in the north and then it changes through the seasons which is one reason why there's a regular monsoon that is the essence of uh, weather patterns in this part of the world and matched by this current that come around the world and br bring up other fresh water, let's say, from other parts of the ocean. But the, the wind patterns here are uh, in the winter, it's a northeast monsoon wind, and then in the summer it turns to southwest, so that particularly for navigation, you would time your, your journeys by the monsoon seasons, either crossing from Arabia to uh, Indonesia and off to China, or back the same way. It would take up a year, and I have to commend uh, our distinguished speaker Tim Severin, you may have seen his film about building a ship in Oman and following the traditional routes and then having the same experience as has had for thousands of years of people crossing the Indian Ocean. And even in the, the uh, agricultural reports and uh, the weather and all of these highly populated places, they very much depend on when does the monsoon begin, which in the summer or in the winter, so that they can plant their crops or they can go out fishing or they can go across the ocean if they need. And this is, uh, if you've lived in this part of the world, you can almost set your watch by the rain patterns. Um, now they're becoming less predictable, but they, they come through and if they're not in season, let's say they're a month late, that can create a lot of trouble for, the, for agriculture and for travel. And so with the, the, let's say, the turbulence in the climate these days, some of these patterns have been upset and People are wondering if it's going to be more stable or less stable. Uh, but these are very much life-giving rains to areas that are otherwise can be completely parched. Now, you already have deserts in the Arabian Peninsula. Um, sometimes that's accentuated by what they call an oceanic oscillation, which is a, every decade about there's a sort of a reversal of some of the patterns. And this is true in the Atlantic and the Pacific. And we're not sure why this happens. It's sort of like a great low-frequency resonance that will then make one area drought prone, another one heavily uh, rainy, and then within 10 years it usually goes the other way. In the Pacific, this is called the uh, El Nino and La Nina effect, and it has a great deal of impact on the land masses, of course, and then even on the other side of continents and to the weather patterns in other oceans now. So this is something that is being studied and is a sort of uh, one of the great mysteries of the sea, why the, the sea, some of the currents and the winds will just be completely opposite for, for a year or two. 
One thing that's predictable are the cyclones and the typhoons. Now these are all the same name, hurricane, uh, for a tropical low pressure depression, which then builds up and out of the tropics will spin out and hit land. Now, in this case, you can see that a lot of these uh, storms, they hit the east coast of Asia, and then they'll come up out of the Indian Ocean, go into the Bay of Bengal, or even up to the Arabian Peninsula. On the southern hemisphere, they'll spin out to East Africa or down into the north coast in the seas around Australia. Well, this is the same pattern you have in hurricanes. I'm sure you've all uh, been to a hurricane party before. But the eye will gather and spin clockwise in the northern hemisphere, the opposite in the southern hemisphere, because of the Coriolis effect, and then it'll travel and dissipate when it hits land, but it draws much of its energy concentration out of the heat of the ocean. So these storms have been getting uh, more destructive as time goes on and the ocean is measurably getting warmer. Well, nonetheless, people would go sailing across the, uh, the Indian Ocean in crafts like this, and again, if you haven't seen the film that Tim Severin um, is showing, that's the real drama of the ancient voyagers in Dows and felucas and the various uh, many different kinds of the particularly the Arab style oceanic traveling boats that were um, usually made out of wood from India then they had cordage and waxen caulking and uh, a lot of them were even uh, sewn together the smaller craft uh, would be like this this one's in uh, Oman that I found so that that kind of uh, boat seems very rickety and, and prone to falling apart in the big sea but actually because they're flexible they tend to ride well um, and they s survived, most of them, uh, though uh, nobody ever went to, s to sea for pleasure back in those days. But people knew that there was another part of the world where there were goods and people that they wanted to meet and have exchange with. And so the Indian Ocean is probably the original ocean of commerce. This is a Babylonian clay tablet with the map of the world featuring their view of it from the Middle East and describing how to go to the great lands to the Far East, meaning pr primarily India at that time, and then beyond. And as the Arab uh, navigators came out in the Indian Ocean, they uh, developed certain rudimentary navigational instruments. This is called the Kamal, which is essentially a sighting stick, which is based on a board and a length of rope you actually hold the string in your mouth and then you will take it out and then you'll sight your star and get a declination for the judgment of your latitude. So typically they will find a, a constellation at night and then they will steer along a line of latitude. Uh, the ninth north latitude is the, the go-to latitude to cross the Indian Ocean because you will go from Arabia um, just by the south, southern tip of Sri Lanka and then end up in the Straits of Malacca near the and Andaman Islands. And even ships like this do that parkour to this day because that's the, the straight line that you can follow across this Indian Ocean. So there were, there were uh, great um, navigators who wrote extensively in Arabic usually about how to cross the sea. Uh, this was the Ahmed um, bin uh, Majid who was the, called the Lion of the Sea because he wrote some 40 books of sailing directions and descriptions of ports and trade goods. And so his um, writings was that were, were then followed and studied by many Arabic uh, navigators and Indian ones. And finally, they, they would go all the way to China. Back in uh, 800 AD in the Tang Dynasty, there were Arab trading posts in South China. And there's a mosque in Guangzhou to this day that were founded by these navigators, came across the Indian Ocean all around up to China. Um, then the, the development of sighting instruments continued on to the astrolabe, again by Arabic, uh, um, usually f based in Baghdad and in, the pr in, in other seaports like Oman where they developed the kind of sighting instruments like the astrolabe that then became the basis for the navigation and then led to our use of the sextant. They also developed maps that were maybe not geographically correct, but they were a good indication of where places were. Then they had very specific small charts. This is a al Adrisi map from uh, 1120 that was again drawn in Baghdad. So this part of the world was quite well known to, to they, uh, the Arabs, and then the Indians, and of course the Chinese would cross the sea. And then the Europeans came and often hired Arabic or Indian pilots to make sure they were getting to where they wanted to go. 
the Romans and then uh, and even earlier the Greeks and Egyptian um, um, navigators and traders would go down the Red Sea and then um, go visit ports. This is the uh, Erythian Sea of Periplus, which was um, published in the original document 100 AD out of Alexandria to describe how do you get to the, particularly the Malabar coast of India where we are on our way to. And this was uh, where the European Mediterranean cultures were reaching out to the greater Indian Ocean and cooperating as much as they could to have what's been called the Maritime Silk Road all the way to India that then extended to China. And the current uh, uh, road and build initiative of the Chinese government is very much to modernize this ancient uh, uh, trade route by land and by sea. Uh, during the um, early Ming Dynasty, the great treasure fleets were sent out of the Yangtze Valley, Nanjing area. Shang Shanghai wasn't a city then, but they came all the way around as is our course through the Straits of Malacca, went to uh, Sri Lanka, India, Arabia, then they went all the way down the coast of Africa and there, there, there are some monuments to those, 14, uh, those visits by Chinese traders in the early 1400s. And it's been said had the Chinese not, let's say, withdrawn their fleets because of domestic problems, they probably would have had Chinese communities and colonies all through Africa and the, and the Indian Ocean area to this day. Instead, they did not stay in their trade routes and then they became an isolated country until recently. But there's still other communities that were established on the shores as traders. This is the plaque at, at the, um, the old synagogue in Cochin where we will be visiting in a number of days. So the traders established posts all around the world uh, to make a, let's say, a, a network for spices, silk, porcelain, um, specialty woods, specialty foods. And so there was a sort of a, a seasonal trade all the way around the uh, Indian Ocean for so many centuries. And it continues to this day, but except it's in, in much greater bulk. And of course, the population is so much greater nowadays. So there's a lot of, uh, let's say, environmental stress upon the land and the sea by the number of people. But it's very much following, in, uh, sh uh, following this example of the intrepid uh, sailor from whatever nation is setting out. And uh, most famously, Sinbad, the sailor, and his uh, stories of the Arabian Nights make this into a, quite a fantastic story. Again, I refer to Tim Severin for it, but uh, uh, there were wonders to be found. And often, of course, it was a one-way trip. You were very lucky to get to where you wanted to go, much less uh, be able to return with a ship laden with goods to uh, make your fortune back in your homeland. And so this, uh, you can imagine how many ships didn't make it. And I'm going to read you a, uh, a little Indian Ocean uh, tale, which I believe was originally in Arabic. But it says, the Indian Ocean is mean and deep and careless sailing off, off death doth reap. It's a wild and vast, a lonesome place to be. Needing to ply these waters has no glee. Angry, relentless waves, tall meters high, and troughs below seem to hide the sails from the sky. There's no release from the swirling spray and foam. The steerman needs lion's heart to bring us home. Course is set by compass, not by sextant in a storm. And the person who sent us here has a hellish bent, which well, I'm sure some of Sinbad's sailors uh, uh, had that feeling because he, he got, got into such trouble and adventure on his sea voyages. Well, when, again, when, you, when in Europe, in the Mediterranean, they, they wanted to go there, um, they relied again on mostly the Arab uh, adventurers and cartographers. So this map published in Venice in 1459 um, illustrates islands in the Indian Ocean coming down here. And then that's probably Madagascar and then the Cape of Good Hope and other points of perhaps imagination. Uh, but the curious thing about this map is that this predated um, Diaz and the other Portuguese who rounded Cape Hope finally. So the question is who had been sailing around Africa before the Europeans knew about it and then gave the knowledge to this particular Venetian cartographer? Well, certain books and scholars said it's probably the Chinese, if not the Arabs, sailed around and then passed the knowledge back. And then, of course, the race was on in Europe to go to the, the Far East to have the spice trade and other 
uh, colonies uh, led by Vasco da Gama who, who took on a Arabic pilot in uh, um, uh, Malindi, an, uh, what's a, a port in what is now Kenya, who then took him around to India, finally got to Calicut, which is near Cochin, and that was the great goal of the European traders, is they would have all of the, the wealth of India, whether it be jewels or spices or other goods, and then they could continue on to the other parts of the world. Particularly these, these charts about where you cross the rum lines crossing the sea that you would follow either by compass or celestial navigation would lead you to these islands and um, of course that meant that there was a great deal of competition between the first the Portuguese and the Spanish uh, dividing the world but then the Dutch and the French and the British and various others came in to establish the uh, colonies all through this area particularly the Portuguese held on to Goa and uh, Malacca and even Macau until just the last number of decades when that empire's remains were finally uh, taken in by the, the, the countries where they lie. Um, but uh, the, the sea routes along the uh, southern part of the Indian Ocean were left pr primarily to the clipper ships who could then would come roaring around in the roaring 40s and could take those big seas and get all the way to Australia and, and around the world. Otherwise, most of the navigation was sort of coastal. Now, these are the sea routes today. Again, through the Sunda Strait, the Straits of Malacca, or else down under, the, down under, and the trans uh, across to Australia, New Zealand, uh, and around Cape Hope. Of course, the opening of the Suez Canal changed the eco economics of the shipping industry, so that um, now you could go right into the Mediterranean. That made a great deal of difference uh, to, that we we appreciate today, because uh, this ship will go through the the Great Canal at Suez. Well, we are here at the leaving the Andaman Sea. I'm just going to show you this uh, uh, satellite view of where we just sailed out. Uh, wasn't that remarkable, the amount of mud that the ship would cook up, I mean, churn up? And I, all I can say, I worry about the, the ship's systems, which often take in water. I think they had to uh, turn off the, the, wa uh, the fresh water uh, maker and many other systems. When you get into a river like that, a ship like this, uh, can't can't drink that very well. Anyway, we were prepared, and now we're back out into the big blue. We had passed by these islands, the Andaman Islands, of which there are a number of different groups in Thailand and uh, Myanmar, and then some of them are Indian. And sometimes uh, we stop in what's called the Andaman Islands, Nicobar, and uh, Port Blair, which is Indian territory, uh, but they're on the outside of the sea and have been very isolated and their aboriginal inhabitants were always very um, resistant to anybody coming there. So to this day, the government of India has a number of them in preserve where nobody is allowed to go there because the, the natives will literally shoot bows and arrows at a helicopter or throw stones at a boat when you go there. And uh, this, of course, leads people to wonder this is whether these are the last Stone Age islanders uh, in the world until Club Med uh, convinces them otherwise. But uh, I was there a number of times, but Port Blair, for your curiosity, was the site of the biggest British prison in all of India, and many political dissidents were then sent to these islands, which was not a vacation. Another thing, uh, right where we are, is the uh, Isthmus of Kra. Now, we've traveled right up here, Singapore up to uh, you know, Myanmar, but uh, that, that uh, Isthmus right there has been proposed as a uh, new canal for Asia to put shipping right from the open o Indian Ocean into the uh, Gulf of Thailand. And it's been debated over 200 years. The royalty of Thailand had always was trying to get somebody to build it for them so they didn't have to afford the tremendous cost of it. And so it still gets bandied about again. The Chinese are talking about doing it, um, putting a canal like the Panama Canal right across the, uh, uh, the southern territory of Thailand. Unfortunately, that's an Islamic uh, neighborhood and they don't want it. And even the shipping companies do, doing the calculations think that it's only going to save about 600 sea miles and it's not as vital to be built as, let's say, the Panama Canal is because there you're saving tens of thousands of miles. Uh, so I don't know if it's ever going to be built, but that's one of those mega engineering projects that um, are always proposed but maybe not uh, ever built. Well, here we're going to take another look at the sea off of South Africa. 
I'm sure you've all been there. This is a famously rough waters off that dramatic points of uh, land at Cape Hope. Uh, when the Portuguese came down here, Diaz, in uh, 1493, I believe it was, uh, he called it the Cabo de, de Tormentos, which is, means a, you know, the troubled, terrible Cape uh, because it has contrary winds and tides. And uh, when he went back to uh, Portugal, they, the king decided to call it the C Cape of Good Hope, Esperanza, just so other people would go down there. But you can go down there and see the marker between the Indian and the Atlantic Ocean and the monuments to the Portuguese explorers. Um, rounding that was uh, of great historic uh, consequence for Europe. And until the Suez Canal was built, that was the only way to get to Asia other than tre trekking over land. But right off of uh, South Africa is the uh, uh, Agulhas uh, Current, which in Portuguese means needles. And it's a sense of how thrashing the sea is. And every year, uh, ships go, go there and they get kind of foundered in the tremendous big waves and the contrary winds. And um, so it's one of the more dangerous parts of the world for navigation, as um, epitomized by the, uh, the legend of the Flying Dutchman. A Dutch s ship went down there and got beaten up off the Cape Hope and never made it land and it's said to be still out there sailing. Well, many of ships were lost back in those days, particularly if they went further south to get away from those storms off of Africa. And then they got caught in the cold water and the ice and the contrary winds down even further south. But this area in the ocean is uh, famous because it has the greatest number of rogue waves, which are a, let's say, a phenomena of vibrations of the wave patterns and the wind and occasionally a tremendous big wave will pick up out of the sea and then swallow vessels whole. And so in this area there are occasional uh, collapses of the hull structures, particularly tankers are prone to this because they have big cavernous interiors and they will literally trough out under a, in the trough of a big wave and then they'll break up and they'll go down without any time to uh, put out an emergency or de deploy boats. So every year there's some, about 10 major vessels that are lost in these seas. And then as you go up the African coast, it gets m much calmer and uh, more, of course, warmer and more pleasant. These are the islands off of Madagascar, which are uh, French possession. And um, they have become a, one of the natural reserves in this particular area because um, there's a lot of fishing on the coast and depletion I'll talk about a bit more, but these particular islands are now uh, designated marine reserves, often of beautiful lagoon like you've seen in the South Pacific, with teeming with life and not any humans that are uh, impacting this area. This uh, Ile Europa was uh, one of the first of the marine reserves, so this is a place where particularly scuba divers and other people will just go to see the, let's say, the Indian Ocean in its uh, intact state, whereas you have deterioration of the marine environment in so many other coastal areas. And uh, again, this uh, near the land you have uh, high chlorophyll, I'm sorry, but high plankton counts and uh, most of the fishing and such is done in these these waters just off the coast and around the islands where the, the shallows will produce a lot of the marine life. Here are the Comoros Islands which are between Madagascar and the African coast off Mozambique. And here you get the kind of variety of people which are um, a lot of them are mixed African, um, Indian, some Arabic blood. And so the whole Indian I uh, islands culture is very much of a syncretic. Uh, then you have British or French uh, on top of this, uh, and so that you have a, a distinctive sort of Indian Ocean population that live on these different islands. Rodriguez, uh, La Réunion, which is very volcanic. It's not active volcano, though. And... Uh, uh, there's a lot of them very lush. If you've been to the Seychelles, for instance, you, you have a sense of this Réunion, that they're a little bit of a world apart out here, far away in the Indian Ocean, with the mixed culture. Mostly the, most of them are, are, are Muslim, actually. Um, my favorite, of course, is the Seychelles. I don't know if you've been there. That's a particularly beautiful group of islands that has now been designated the largest marine preserve in all the Indian Ocean through funding from Europe, they have wanted to become an example for not just for the tourism, but just to have a marine reserve so that the depletion of species near the other continental coast can be matched by keeping a preserve in, on these beautiful islands. And you've, this is Seychelles, these tremendous rocks on the shore. 
You may have been to the, uh, the Maldives, which have a lot of resorts and built up on their islands. They're actually evacuating some of them now and building seawalls around the ones they think will uh, survive the, the creeping up of the sea levels. So there are hundreds of islands there, and the Japanese are, have invested uh, in the Maldives to help them build uh, constructions to protect the islands, but they did that in exchange for fishing rights. So between the fishing and the tourism, uh, you know, some of these islands are prosperous, but it depends on the future of our climate, and a lot of these low-lying areas may, be, may have to be abandoned eventually. Well, here's one more island, Madagascar. I don't know if you've been there. That's quite a uh, kind of a mini continent to itself. And it, it had been an extremely lush island, but most of it has been deforested and turned into plantations. And then the population has doubled every generation for 100 years, so now it's a very crowded and a very poor island. But it, it has some very distinctive uh, features in it. This is a stone forest that is an example of a seabed that had been lifted up and then eroded into making this very unusual um, landscape. And across, just up the coast of Africa, you have, uh, Tanzania, when it, it used to be called Tan, uh, Tanganyika, which actually is an Arabic term for the coast of the blacks, because Zanzibar had been an Omani island and a center for their own slave trade. And ag again, it, it's now part of the, uh, the country of Tan Tanzania, but if you haven't been to Zanzibar, it's one of the more colorful places, because again, you have this Indian Ocean mixed breed uh, community, a lot of different... Uh, uh, religion and variety of languages. It's a very pungent place. And of course it had been uh, at one point under one empire or the other. Now the old British in Indian Ocean territories have now dwindled just to a few islands. Uh, they used to be so strategically important because you'd have coaling stations for the Navy all through this ocean. Now it's not as um, uh, strategically important anymore. But some of these islands are again natural preserve, marine preserves, the Cocos Islands and uh, uh, again, lagoons and shallows that are full of life. This is Diego Garcia, which turned into a major military base to this day. And, and this is a bit of an issue because some of the indigenous people were m removed from the islands to make way for the military and have had to be compensated. Well, I'm going to show you a few more islands just in the, the far chance that you actually go there. Um, these little specks of islands down toward Antarctica are usually either French or British territory, but with no population usually. They're, they are so far away and so cold in the winter and uh, barren, but they have mostly scientific stations on some of them. Uh, here's uh, Ile Amsterdam. Some of them are active volcanoes when you go f further south down there. Uh, so these are about the most isolated places in the world, Ile Kerguelen. Uh, remind me of the Falkland Islands, actually. When, uh, when you go there, they're sort of barren of much life, except in the sea and the penguins and such. And the Indian Ocean is just full of, of course, a tremendous population in m almost all of the shore communities, which is a serious problem because, again, uh, the rule of thumb in developing countries is that population doubles every generation. So that uh, the World Fisheries Organization said the Indian Ocean fisheries, uh, 1950 uh, pulled in a, less than a million ton of fish, but in the last decade they've been averaging 12 to 15 million tons of landed fish all through this area, meaning that almost all the major species have been depleted, especially by the big tractor processing fish uh, factories that go out into the maj major sea and they, and they take everything, and the bycatches of course, just killed, and therefore the sea becomes a desert. So in all these countries, they've been protesting the international fleets, which are primarily Chinese, Spanish, Russian, uh, Japanese. And so this is one of the problems that has fueled piracy, because the local fishermen go out and there's nothing left for them, and their turning to piracy has been partly out of desperation. And so they've been trying to keep the, you know, especially the big factory fish away from the shore, so there's something for the local people. And the Indian Ocean is now patrolled by a, a joint uh, naval force so that it you know, tries to keep peace in this whole area. You can see all of these different countries, they all have uh, the same problem. They're on the shore of a rich ocean that has been greatly depleted. So again, they're trying to make more marine reserves. Uh, this is in the Chagos so that the animals will survive and prosper or rather multiply and have enough food. Now these are the southern right whale, again, an endangered 
species. I'll just show you a few of the creatures you might have seen. Whale lice. Now those are pretty big lice, so I don't recommend getting them in your hair. Um, there's also whale sharks, which are the largest of uh, the plankton feeders, which are all through the Indian Ocean. And unfortunately, now the, the um, Chinese fleets have been targeting them uh, as a specialty food. They capture some for aquariums, and they're quite a fantastic sight. Um, then there's some, occasionally here's an albino whale shark, which is a, a diver saw. And then many other species on the reefs and in the, on the shores, uh, different this is the, uh, the speckled crab and other ones, uh, the Hall uh, Halloween hermit crab. So everywhere has its uh, curious inhabitants uh, if they're left alone. This is the scariest of them all, the, uh, the Bathonesis gigantis. Again, you don't want to uh, get that in your, on your dinner table. But one of the more famous fish that's been found down here is the Seosant, which is a ancient, where well, they thought extinct, fish that they found in deep waters off, off of South Africa. And this uh, has a history of maybe a mi um, um, hundred million years of evolution, and this particular fish lives on the bottom in the very, very deep coal, and um, is rarely caught or seen. Another thing in the part of, off the coast of Africa is there's a, they found a, a kind of an ooze out of, made out of uh, uh, photo and um, zooplankton that covered the ocean floor and sort of a living goo. And of course, when people came first out of this area from Europe, they thought it was quite fantastic. There are all these different birds and animals that they had never seen before. Most famously, the dodo of Mauritius, which sailors would come and be able to club. They were completely tame and knock them out and have them as stores on their ship. And so they went extinct except in Alice in Wonderland. But it's now, the, you have a couple skeletons in museums. But uh, they're long gone as a passive, uh, easy prey for humans. But there are others that are in danger. This is the Nicobar pigeon that was originally hunted for feathers for hats. You have emu, which are, which are not in danger. They're all through southern Africa. You have big tortoises in the Seychelles, sort of like the Galapagos. And so when the preserves are made and, the, and these animals are not uh, afflicted, then they, uh, let's say, have their natural life, and so then they can, um, uh, let's say, multiply and prosper. And uh, in that sense, uh, you may run across this. This is a, a special coconut in uh, Mauritius and other islands that call a coco de mer, which is considered a, uh, they grind it up and make it as an aphrodisiac in Indian Ayurvedic medicine. So you have all these islands, different climates, different people, and I'm going to leave you just with another poem by a, an Indian writer who, who said, Cerulean sky, a dove with an olive branch, no march pass below, no guns, no army men waiting patiently to receive it. This dream in my mind, flowers in an army man's hand, a single sky above, and only one race called human, for blood has just one color. And so as you look out on the ocean, like these monks in Sri Lanka, you can take the, this ocean as a great meditation and appreciate, particularly we come out in the center ocean, has these tremendous skies and storm squalls occasionally, but it's a very beautiful ocean like uh, most of the oceans. But this, the Indian Ocean is, is very colorful for some reason. I've been across it and taken these pictures. So I'll leave you with one more poem of this Dr. Ram Mehta from India. And he says, uh, whenever I should look at the sea, I shall remember you. With all of its depths and treasures, I have always been near the sea. And so you can't be away from me. I know we are soon to depart, going far away from each other. But your Atlantic Ocean meets my Indian Ocean somewhere. And there is no boundary between the two. Even in a storm, they are together since time immemorial. One ocean and one heart. And so with these passing storms and drama out in the sea, I think you can just appreciate uh, how vast the world is and how beautiful it can be on the right uh, place in the right time of day, including uh, finding your very special island. I think it's right over there. Uh, whatever the Indian Ocean version of uh, Bali High, there it is. Anyway, thank you very much. My pleasure to be with you on this great scene. Thank you.